Hi, this is another piece of our management and leadership work, part one. And today we're going to focus on, or in this segment, we're going to focus on Elton Mayo and what has become known as the Hawthorne Studies. Mayo is an Australian born citizen who studied uh, in Melbourne, if I remember correctly, in Australia. And he wasn't able uh, to get the teaching position that he wanted. And that led him to say, all right, I'm going to England, and uh, on my way, I'm going to stop in the U.S. and see what's going on over there. He had scheduled a visit to San Francisco. Poor guy landed on the ground, and, I mean, almost immediately, people were asking him to come and speak here, go speak there. And he had actually honed his public speaking skills and really valued that. So not only was he a guy who had a lot to say and, and really insightful things about how what happens in the workplace affects productivity, but he was good at explaining it to people. Eventually, after some of that public speaking, the University of Pennsylvania, based on a grant from Rockefeller, um, got him and they, it, it, at Pennsylvania, he did a study on rest pauses in productivity, meaning a break. How long does a person pause to get an increase in productivity, for example? What he found was that it improved productivity. Uh, not a great shock there. Um, what happened though was these pauses got instituted into the usual work day and uh, Foreman, when Mayo was gone, <laughs> would remove them from the work day. And so, you know, it just imagine, oh, thank gosh, thank goodness, Dr. Mayo is here. We get to take a few seconds off now and then. Oh, Dr. Mayo's gone. The foremen are going to work him to death without a moment to breathe, right? So this back and forth eroded trust. It eroded job satisfaction for all kinds of reasons. Uh, eventually, there was a dramatic decrease in productivity. And the work that Mayo did at University of Pennsylvania led to uh, sort of the thesis of all the work that Mayo did for the better part of the rest of his life. And that thesis is treat employees humanely. Eventually, Mayo went to Harvard and uh, started doing some work there where he wanted to, you know, do more about what is having an effect on uh, the physical and psychological welfare of employees. What's happening in workplaces to have an effect on employees. It wasn't long after he'd been there that Western Electric asked him for his opinion on some research they had. And what they had discovered in their research was not exactly counter, but not parallel enough to uh, Mayo's University of Pennsylvania research for them to feel okay about it. So they said, look, you found that taking a pause, having a rest can improve productivity. What we found was that it does both. So what's going on? And he said, ah, you know, my guess is that attitude is part of the explanation. So Western Electric began a large scale research program to try to assess attitudes about work. Of course, Mayo became interested. And uh, as part of the first study uh, included some interviewing and he started participating in helping to prepare the interviewers. Because of his background in psychology and psychotherapy, he knew a lot about listening. And he spent a lot of time teaching people uh, what are essentially the same good listening practices of psychotherapists today. That first study is called the Illumination Study. And what they would do is um, they were looking for what kind of lighting was optimal for worker output. In one room, the light was constant, so they had a control. And in another room, the light was increased and it was decreased. Okay, in both rooms, output increased. Now, mind you, they interviewed the people who were participating in this program, okay, in the illumination study whether they were in the control room or the room where the lighting was increased and decreased. 
in both rooms output increased, but there was not a significant difference. You would normally have expected, that's why we call it control, that there'd be a significant difference, usually, between control room and output room, or, you know, variable room, but there wasn't. Both rooms went up. Within a year of that time, Mayo was overseeing the entire program of over 10,000 employees, and it eventually bloomed a little bit more than that, and there were over 20,000 people involved. He used his interest in background in psychotherapy and spent years at a place called Hawthorne Works of the Western Electric Company in Chicago, Illinois. Out of this, he eventually published with Roethlisberger and Dixon a book called Management and the Worker, and it is the foundation of today's management, just like Taylor's is, except this piece plays a huge role in what we call more of a human relations approach. So let's take a look at the studies a little bit more. The second study that they ran is called the Relay Assembly Study. In this study, there were five females assembled uh, five females who assembled telephone relays. There were 35 small parts and they put them all together. They manipulated all kinds of factors, hours, rest, time of day, pay, talk among workers. Productivity and satisfaction increased regardless of what changes were made. They decided that it must be the supervisory practices that were creating the change in output and in worker satisfaction. So they designed another study and this one was called the interviewing program. They got, uh, they did interviews of workers and um, like lots and lots of workers and just because they were talking to them, oh, excuse me, what I really mean is just because they were listening to them. People said, I feel better already just because someone is listening. So by the time they finished that one, there were over 21,000 people who had participated. They took all of that information and designed what turned out to be the final study in the Hawthorne experiments. And it's called uh, the bank wiring room observation. Okay, they designed it as a result of the others. And social groups um, will have some control over production of the individual. This was the idea. Is that what's happening, they said. Is there a form of informal leadership operating that restricts or encourages employee output? There were 14 bank wiremen, and they completed their own individual tasks, although they were separated from the rest of the workers. They did not know the nature of the study, and there was a researcher in the room who acted like a disinterested observer. Each worker artificially restricted his own output. In fact, output was lower than company-established targets. There were, what was happening was they were informally imposing group norms. Informal organization can constrain employee behavior. This was the first time through data that anyone had discovered that their informal networks, informal power structures, play a role in productivity and efficiency. That was the finding from the bank wiring study. All right, what did we learn overall? Well, the illumination study led to the notion that just observing people's behavior can alter their behavior. And that is what is now known as the Hawthorne effect. How did it get translated? Pay attention to your workers, even just a little bit, and you might increase satisfaction and productivity. From the relay assembly test room, what happened was management began, as a result of what we learned from this study, to change how they interacted. It affected human relationships between workers and up and down the vertical chain. Prior to that, it was not really considered that relationships in the workplace were of any use or of any influence. So we learned that they were of use and of influence, although we didn't know too much about it. 
on this study. In the interviewing program, we learned that upward communication, communication from the worker to the person he or she works for, can play a huge role in attitudes and satisfaction and productivity. And from the bank wiring study, future theorists, not right away, began to account for the existence of informal communication. Remember that Taylor and Fail and Weber, they, they really didn't pay any attention to communication and didn't even acknowledge it, much less consider whether it had any function and how well the organization worked. But from the bank wiring study, we finally realized that communication, upward and horizontal, can play a role in organizations. And again, future theorists started exploring what role that was. The Hawthorne studies as a whole represented a major turning point, huge, in management theory and the foundation of what we do to manage people and lead people today. They were the trigger for understanding the role, for, for researchers to begin understanding the role of communication in effective management. Okay, that covers it for the Hawthorne studies. Thanks for your time.